Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're gonna talk about uh, a few different things. Another sign in the heavens, that's gonna be actually the crux of what this video is gonna be about. Uh, after I had prepared it, I went on the church website and I see that now the conference talks are up. So uh, that didn't take very long. Normally it doesn't uh, for the church website. Um, so I'm gonna be excited to go through this and uh, pick out all the different things that I've wanted to uh, pick out and, and clarify and put together and, you know, make some videos and think about different concepts. Uh, so the one that I have up is uh, the name of this talk, the one where he's talking about the last wagon. The name of the talk is In the Path of Their Duty. And already uh, there's something interesting that I found in here, but I'll save that for maybe the next video. Um, so you can expect uh, upcoming videos to be about this conference now that we have access to the talks. Uh, one person was asking or saying, I, you know, I hope that you update the phrase tracker. And yes, I will. But this one, uh, this is dependent on when they have it updated on the scripture citation index. Okay. It's uh, this website right here. Put, uh, put together by BYU. And this is what allows you to quickly and easily search the scriptures uh, teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, the Journal of Discourses, and all general conference talks going back to uh, April 1942. But as you can see, uh, they don't have the most recent one up yet. And it's been my experience since I've started this channel that it usually takes them about like a month or two before they have this updated. <clears throat> but uh, you can always, you know, do this exercise yourself uh, if you want to put together your own phrase tracker. You just go down here to search at the bottom right, and then you can uh, filter it. Like, let's say that you just want to see a certain phrase that's been said in general conference. So say that you're looking for second coming, and then you want to count it up and see how often it's been said the way that I do. And then uh, it'll bring up all the results right here. And then what I do is I just look at, you know, see, you see right here, it says 2023, 2023. I just add these up, take a tally. You can do control F and uh, do like 2023. <clears throat> and that kind of uh, uh, quickens the process, expedites it a little bit. So uh, that's basically what I do. And, and I will. I will do it for all these different words and phrases that I've searched for. I'm sure there's going to be more in the future that I search that I don't have on here yet. If you have any ideas, feel free to send them my way. Um, there's a good chance, though, that whatever you send my way, I may have already looked for, but don't <clears throat> don't hesitate to send send me something, and I don't mind doing the legwork to um, to update it on this spreadsheet. So that'll be really fun and interesting to look at. And uh, the way that I have this set up, by the way, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically what I do is I look uh, from now back to 2018, because that was President Nelson's first year as president of the church. And I roughly have this organized according to the year that these words were said the most. So you see how there's like a dark line up here for 2023? That's because I have these grouped together uh, because over the last few years, uh, 2023 is the most, it is the year that these were said the most or they tie with previous years. So either they were said the most or they tie with previous years. For example, flood. Um, it ties with 2022, but I'm going to put it on this line because it's the most current, okay? And so then you just go like this, and then you see 2022. So this was the year that these were said the most, and then uh, you go all the way to the end, okay? So um, <clears throat> hopefully they'll update that sooner than later on the Scripture Citation Index. All right, got a couple emails. I uh, got one from Grant Polsander. Uh, Grant is very on top of what's going on at Temple Square and with temples all throughout the world. He's a very good source of information for me, always keeping me updated. So I thank you, Grant. He says, uh, in, in regards to the Salt Lake Temple and uh, the plaza and the Temple Square and all that stuff, when it's going to be done, and, and I trust him, believe me. <laughs> if there's anybody I trust, it's Grant when it comes to these dates. Okay, he says, the Main Street Plaza... The, okay, you know what? We better visualize this. Um, 
like I don't know if you're outside of Utah like is it is it easy for you to picture the Temple Square area are you like familiar with it I don't know if it's just because I'm from Utah I've been there like a million times uh, to Temple Square but anyway I'll just do this in case you're not really familiar with it okay so just as a reminder these two blocks right here are the ones that are undergoing renovation okay they're basically tying in uh what was uh before now referred to as temple square and i guess it still will be but they want to tie in traditional historic uh temple square which is this city block and tie it in even more with the block to the east where you have the church office building joseph smith memorial building administration building um the lion house and so on and so forth okay so let's uh let's go to his email the main street plaza and the church office building will be complete at the end of this year. Okay. So at the end of this year, um, he's talking about the church office building. Uh, and I don't know if there's like individual, like some kind of renovation going on with the building itself. So you'll have to let me know in the comments below or email. So church office building and main street plaza, what was uh, main street at one time, these will be finished by the end of the year, according to Grant. Okay. Uh, gardens and contemplation spaces will be complete at the end of the year also. So maybe just like all over Temple Square? I don't know. Okay. So, so you get an idea of what's going to be done by the end of this year. Okay. And then he says, structural and seismic upgrades of the Salt Lake Temple should wrap up in May 2024. Finish work should begin in August 2024. So uh, this is something to think about. Um, I, I don't really know how I feel about it. Uh, there's a lot of people that strongly feel that the completion of the Salt Lake Temple, um, the renovation is related to when the second coming will happen. Maybe it won't happen until the temple is completed. Maybe it won't happen until the seismic upgrading is completed, but not the temple as a whole. Who knows? You know, it's all just speculation. I wouldn't be surprised myself, as I've expressed a billion times. I wouldn't be surprised if the second coming happens anytime, because I think for some people that are a little bit more on the unwise side, uh, they like to just think, well, it's not going to happen before this, or, you know, the church is doing this, so it they, they can't possibly be soon. I uh, would not be so sure about that, but we'll just have to wait and see. And I'm not saying that if you, if you think that, that you're unwise. I think there's people that are just generally asleep that kind of like look at these things in passing and they're just like, oh yeah, we're still good. We still got so much time. Not so sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then it is anticipated that the Salt Lake Temple should be complete in late 2025. So, uh, if that's the case, th that would mean that in 2025, that's when they're going to do, you know, uh, the open house. And that's going to be a huge thing to have people going through the Salt Lake Temple. Uh, it's, it's a very rare thing for any of the public to be able to go through the Salt Lake Temple. So, it's going to be uh, essentially for a lot of people, I think, a once in a lifetime event for those that aren't members of the church. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of missionary opportunities that take place during open houses and dignitaries and stuff come through. So that'll be exciting to see. And that's going to be a couple years from now. Hopefully, hopefully the second coming will have happened before then. But if not, let's just be patient and keep watching all the things that are happening. So thank you, Grant, for the email. Got another email. I wanted to I'm not going to put the name because the name is like in the email and I don't have any other names. So we're, we're just going to go with uh, anonymous for this one. Subject line, last days. And she says, I was reading 3 Nephi 27 verse 5. Have they not read the scriptures which say, you must take upon you the name of Christ, which is my name. For by this name shall you be called at the last day. It made me think of President Nelson when he changed the name of the church. And, uh, of course, I, he didn't actually change the name. I'm sure that you know that. Maybe just how it was typed. But uh, he reemphasized that we need to use the proper name of the church. 
and not use Mormon, avoid using LDS. Um, because when you, because he said, I think it was him specifically that said that when you, when you use Mormon LDS or you shorten the name of the church, you, uh, inadv- inadvertently take out the most significant part of the name, which is Jesus Christ. So as I've said before, that's why, uh, the name of my channel, it was going to be latter day homestead. And that's actually how it started for like the first like week or two or month. I can't remember how long, but, um, I, I came across that concept and I was like, you know what? That's right. I should not do latter day homestead. I should do, uh, let's just do Christian homestead. Fine. And I think because of that, there's been a lot of people that haven't been members of our church that have come across my channel. I don't know if that's been for the better or not. I haven't heard any like success stories because of that, but who knows? Who knows what kind of influence that may have had, um, by the time all this is done. But, um, yeah, I think I, I think that's a really good thought that in the lead up to the second coming, we really, really need to make sure that in all areas we take upon ourselves Christ and be called by his name, including using the proper name of the church. That's probably a key component uh, for welcoming the Savior. Um, that's how you would want to call yourself uh, before he comes and when he does come. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that is important. And uh, in this general conference, and maybe I'll have this for the next video, I wanted to go through and see uh, who all had used or who all had mentioned this concept, because I know that it's been, it was said in, in at least like two or three talks mentioning that we need to use the correct name of the church this last uh, general conference. So I'm excited to look that up because... That was like one of the things that they were stressing. And I'm not so sure that they really did that too much, you know, in April or or even October of last year. The first time that President Nelson uh, started stressing this was in the April. Wait, am I right? Yeah, if I'm. Pr- uh, maybe I'm wrong. President Nelson, correct name of the church. <clears throat> oh, this was at, this was uh, the first, no, sorry, his second general conference, October 2018, the correct name of the church. His whole talk was about it. So that's like one of the first things that he did at the beginning of his presidency was uh, call attention to the fact that we need to start using the correct name of the church and that it's not trivial and that it's uh, important. So... And then we went one step further in uh, 2020 with the new church symbol that was introduced. So using the correct name of the church, you know, calling ourselves by his name as he's about to come in and rule. And then uh, using him as the iconography for the church with the new church symbol. So thank you, Anonymous, for the email and for that thought. That is something to think about. Okay, next... Um, what do I got next? What do I have next? Yes, that's right. I got this email from uh, Jim Van Sickle. The subject line says, giant asteroid the size of 100 capib- capybaras <laughs> to pass Earth Tuesday. So uh, that was yesterday. NASA, the Jerusalem Post. So I, I pulled this up. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, that is happening. Now, um, I couldn't find anything that was particularly unique about this or whatever. I mean, I I guess it was big enough to where the Jerusalem Post decided to write an article about it. I'm sure that others did, too. But what I'm more uh, concerned with is not so much what was in this article, since there wasn't really too much there, but the time that this is happening. You know, we always have, there's always asteroids flying around in space and comets and so on and so forth. So what makes one potentially significant? Well, I think it's when it happens during a certain time um, or if there's like any unique characteristics of that event. And with this one, there is. So if we uh, consult hebcal.com, uh, where you can see the Gregorian calendar and the Hebrew calendar, laid on top of that. Uh, Tuesday, yesterday, was the fourth day of Sukkot, 
which is the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths. So it happened during this time. You know, it wasn't on the first. Uh, now, interestingly, though, this year, uh, conference started on the first of the the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles on Sukkot 1. So, uh, but then we have this asteroid that uh, comes by just, uh, let's see, one, two days after conference and during the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, I don't know that it means anything, but I'm going to take note. And uh, I, I want to show you something that you may have, may have not seen, okay? For some reason, people just did not watch this video where I talked about how within the last year, well, let me see. Well, now it's been just a little bit over a year, but within the last uh, year and a month, we've had three times when uh, we've had, okay, so we've had three sets of three asteroids pass by Earth, and they were on very significant days. So the first one, uh, this is on my signs, comets, meteors, and asteroids spreadsheet. So on September 20th of last year, which was on Rosh Hashanah, there were three asteroids that passed close to the Earth. And one of them was particularly close. Now, if you want to read more about it, I have my references over here to the right. Okay. So this first set, one of the asteroids was particularly close to the Earth. All right, so those went by. And then on Christmas Day of last year, which also happened to be the eighth day of Hanukkah, the last day of lighting the candles, the, the final candle, uh, there were three giant asteroids that passed by the Earth on Christmas Day in the eighth day of Hanukkah. All right, so that's kind of weird. Well, there was one more set this year, uh, just a couple weeks ago, and of all days, it was on Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement. And it's the holiest day on the Hebrew calendar in Judaism. And on that day, there were three asteroids that passed by Earth, and one of them was particularly close. It's almost like a... I, I, you know, I don't like using this term because this isn't like... We're not talking about poetry or writing or anything, but it's like a chiasmus where you have this like mirror type thing happening where you have like one main thing in the middle and the one that was in the middle was Christmas and Hanukkah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it means, if it means anything at all, but I'm going to take note of it because I don't tend to think that things are coincidental. So, uh, and, and by the way, what's interesting to note is that the last set of three uh, asteroids that passed by the Earth that happened on the 25th of September and uh, if we come here to my second coming timeline, zoom in. It just so happens that the week before, almost, almost exactly a week before, for the first time in church and world history, frankly, uh, we, we uh, dedicated three temples on the same day. And guess what day they were dedicated on? On Rosh Hashanah. Brasilia, Brazil, Bentonville, Arkansas, Moses Lake, Washington. First time, it was on the 17th, it was on Rosh Hashanah, a week later, on Yom Kippur, three asteroids passed by the Earth. Very strange. So, with this most recent one, um, I don't know, I'm just going to take note of it. I'm going to put it right here. Uh, asteroid 349507. 2008 QY passes by Earth on Sukkot 4, the Feast of Tabernacles. Very interesting. Um, I have the other articles here in case you want to in, ca in case you want to check these out uh, on your own. I'll make it easier for you, and I'll put the links for these uh, articles in the uh, description below. Uh, they're all for, they're all from Jerusalem Post, except for this one from Newsweek. Three giant asteroids will have close encounter with Earth on Christmas Day. Just fascinating signs in the heavens. These are signs in the heavens to me. Now, why would uh, this matter? Like why? Like for example, 
uh, this really big asteroid that passed by yesterday. Why would that matter? Well, it may matter for the same reason that comets matter. Uh, because let's remind ourselves what Joseph Smith said about uh, comets and heavenly bodies. So this is for Sign of the Son of Man. Okay, first we're going to read from, uh, this is in The Words of Joseph Smith, put together by Andrew F. F. E. Hat or A. Hat and Lyndon W. Cook, page 181. Uh, so this is like a compilation of uh, uh, basically talks that he gave, uh, like Joseph Smith gave that were written down. These are like transcribed notes. Okay, and the and the spelling is not me. It's it's how I copied it. This is how it how it was actually written down the first time by whoever took the note. So, read Matthew twenty four chapter and all the prophets. He says, "Then shall they see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven." How are we to see it? Answer: As the lighting up of the morning of the dawning of the morning cometh from the east and shineth unto the west so also is the coming of the Son of Man. The dawning of the morning makes its appearance in the east and moves along gradually, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be small at its first appearance and gradually becomes larger until every eye shall see it. Shall the saints understand it? Oh yes, Paul says so. Shall the wicked understand? Oh no, they attribute it to a natural cause. They will probably suppose it to be suppose it is two great comets coming in contact with each other. It will be small at first and will grow larger and larger until it will be all in a blaze so that every eye shall see it. Okay, so that's one account of what um, Joseph Smith said. There's also this one in Scriptural Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 280. The editor, as well as some others, thinks that Joe Smith has met his match at last because Mr. Redding thinks that he has seen the sign of the Son of Man. But I will use my right and declare that, notwithstanding Mr. Redding may have seen a wonderful appearance in the clouds one morning about sunrise, which is nothing very uncommon in the winter season, he has not seen the sign of the Son of Man, as foretold by Jesus. Neither has any man, nor will any man, until after the sun shall have been darkened and the moon bathed in blood. By the way, I just have to say it every time, President Hinckley, the General Conference, right after 9-11, said that that scripture was fulfilled. Look it up. It's the very, it's the very first uh, talk of the, of the October 2001 General Conference, one month after 9-11. He said that that was fulfilled. For the Lord hath not shown unto me, or not, hath not shown me any such sign, and as the prophet saith, so it must be. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Therefore, hear this, O earth. The Lord will not come to reign over the righteous in this world in 1843 or until everything for the bridegroom is ready. Don't worry, I'm, get, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's more to talk about. Okay, this is also from Scriptural te Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 287. Judah must return, Jerusalem must be rebuilt, and the temple and water come out from under the temple, and the waters of the dead of the Dead Sea be healed. We've already talked about that. There's interesting things happening with the Dead Sea. Just search for Dead Sea on my channel. Uh, it seems like that's taking place. It, at least water seems to be coming from the direction of where the temple will be, from Jerusalem. Uh, just go watch that video. Okay, it will take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, etc. And all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance. There will be wars and rumors of wars, signs in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, the sun turned into darkness and the moon to blood, earthquakes in diverse places, the seas heaving beyond their bounds. Then will appear one grand sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But what will the world do? They will say it is a planet, a comet, etc., and I don't know, maybe that etc. would be an asteroid or some other thing. But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the Son, as the, oh my gosh. But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. Um, okay, this is from Hiram M. Smith in 
John, I think it's John Sodal or Shodal, Doctrines and, Doctrine and Covenants Commentary, page 691. Notwithstanding, Mr. Redding may have seen a wonderful appearance in the clouds one morning about sunrise, which is not very uncommon in the winter season. He has not seen the sign of the Son of Man, as foretold by Jesus. Neither has any man, nor will any man, until after the sun shall have been darkened and the moon bathed in blood. For the Lord hath not shown me any such sign. And as the prophet saith, so it must be. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his, his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Therefore, hear this, O earth, the Lord will not come to reign over the righteous in this world in 1843, nor until everything for the bridegroom is ready. It may be gathered from this that when, okay, end quote, and then the commentary, it may be gathered from this that when the sign appears, God will make its meaning known to the prophet, seer, and revelator, who at that time may be at the head of the church, and through him uh, to his people and the world in general. Now, we don't know what that's going to look like uh, or how that's going to be announced, but uh, I'm sure that that's the case. And I have to wonder, as I've wondered many times, October 2022, some very unusual things were said that have not been said in conference before, uh, specifically in this talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest, where President Nelson says, I call upon you... I might as well just read it again. It's worth repeating. President Nelson says, As I have stated before, the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on the earth today. One crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. A people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world. A people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. Watch the video, look at his body language, his pause, his everything, his tone of voice. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. That's never been said before. Um, and then in his last talk, he shows the video of Christ coming to the people of the Book of Mormon as though to give us a visual. Um, but earlier in the talk, look what he says. But my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns, quote, with power and great glory, end quote, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. So what is he quoting there with power and great glory? Uh, he cites Joseph Smith Matthew uh, verse 36. And as I said before, after the tribulation of those days and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see this, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So President Nelson, <clears throat> he cites this scripture. And I wanted to know this time, because I don't think I had done this before, I wanted to see how many times this scripture uh, has been cited in General Conference. So I did it. I searched both uh, Joseph Smith Matthew 36, which of course is basically the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 24. And I also searched Matthew 24 verse 30, uh, which is the corresponding uh, verse. So uh, with Matthew 24, 30, we have not heard this cited in a very long time. The last time that this has been cited was uh, 1967. Interestingly, that was the year of the Six-Day War when Israel captured Jerusalem. Uh, so there's a number of times that it's been cited, mostly in the Journal of Discourses and uh, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. And then only a handful of times in General Conference um, since 1942. One, two, three, four, five, six times, and that's it. And uh, none of these by the president of the church. Now, what about the Joseph Smith uh, Matthew 36? Well, this one has been cited even less, like far less. One time in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, one time in the Journal of Discourses by Orson F. Whitney, 
And then the only other time is by President Nelson, October 2022. And uh, he is the only president of the church, uh, at least since 1942, that has cited anything having to do with the sign of the Son of Man. So I think that's significant. I think that's very, very significant. I don't know that it's these asteroids or these comets that we've been tracking. I don't know if it was a Muamua, which was a, it was an interstellar object. In fact, I've been keeping track on this uh, spreadsheet, uh, all interstellar objects. Okay. Meaning that they're from outside the solar system because it wasn't until relatively recently that we've seen, uh, that we've, recorded and observed objects from outside of our solar system. So, for example, uh, the 8th of January, 2014, uh, we had a meteor that crashed to Earth. And uh, according to this source, okay, I have a couple of sources here. First observed interstellar object. Harvard University astrophysicist Avi Loeb uh, believes it to be alien technology. So, that, okay, that takes a little bit of a twist, but... The first observed interstellar object. Okay, 2014. What about the next one? The next one was Amuamua. I've done a number of videos about Amuamua. Uh, look it up on my channel. This is an object that was very strange. The shape was strange. The trajectory, the its characteristics. Not, I'm not going to go over all that. But that came in 2017, a very significant year. It was the year of the eclipse, the year of the Revelation 12 sign. It was the year of uh, Trump and so many other things. It was the last year of President Nelson or President Monson's presidency. Uh, we had our second observed interstellar object. And then, uh, let's see, what do we have after that? Okay, first... Oh, um... I need to make a correction right here. I forgot to delete that. Okay. Okay. So then in 2019, uh, we have 2i Borisov that was discovered. And this is the third interstellar object to enter our solar system. And the first observed rogue comet, meaning like a comet that's not part of the, the so-called Oort cloud, which is like... Um, it's basically where they think most comets come from, like way, way out in the outer uh, limits of the solar system. So they're basically saying that this is a comet not from the Oort cloud, not from our solar system, from outside of our solar system, a, a rogue comet. Okay, So that was discovered in 2019. Closest approach to Earth, um, also 2019, on uh, the 28th of December just a few days after Christmas. And then I think that, yeah, that's it. So we've seen those four uh, interstellar objects. Uh, all, of have, all of them have been observed, like I said, relatively recently within the last 10 years. And, uh, and then we have these comets that I just told you about. Um, again, nothing particularly special about this one, but uh, it's happening during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is uh, somewhat noteworthy. But what I think is even more noteworthy are, are these three sets of three asteroids that come that come on uh, even more significant days. All we can do is just take note of it and then see if it means anything in the end. Um, so, yeah, the sign of the Son of Man. President Nelson, the only prophet uh, to have cited this scripture going back to 1942. I don't know. Is he letting us know for those that are watching that that time is coming? Well, yeah, I, th I think so. Why, why else would he cite that if it still wasn't like for a long, long time from now? I would take this seriously. I would take him calling us to be the people of the second coming seriously. I would take his uh, April 2019 warning seriously, where he said that time is running out. Next year, in April, it's going to be five years since he said that. 
I would take everything that he said as a, as a warning and take it seriously. And uh, I'm excited to look into his talk from this conference because it was f- full of warnings. You know, just full of warnings. Okay. Um, let's see. That's going to be that. Let me just take a look really quick and see where we're at with this video. Okay. For the last part of this, I wanted to... Uh, well, let's do two things. First, I want to show you how uh, what they were talking about in these talks that cited Matthew twenty four thirty, just to show you how they've talked about it in general conference. And then I want to read uh, most, if not all, of this talk, which is on the shorter side, which is why I don't mind reading it, um, called Christ Will Come Again. Uh, this is one one of the ones that I came across, and... Uh, he was saying some pretty interesting things in here, so I thought it'd be, it'd be worth reading this. It's from uh, 1966. Okay, so first, let's go over here. Let's go to 1967. This is Victor L. Brown. He is of the presiding bishopric. So I'm just going to kind of see, you know, what they said. I already kind of sk- skimmed through this, but what I want you to pay attention to is there's a lot of... You know, just, just the nature of this uh, community, so to speak, you know, watching for the signs of the times, um, a part of it is not knowing exactly how things are going to happen, uh, sometimes not understanding scripture and uh, just sticking to our own guesses and interpretation. I'm far more interested in hearing how the prophets and apostles and general authorities think about scriptures. And so this is one way that you can find out using the scripture citation index. There's some people that when they, when they talk about the sign of the son of man, they think it's going to be like, um, like a separate sign, like some kind of heavenly sign, but separate from Christ coming. Uh, it is Christ coming. That's what the sign of the son of man is. Let me just show you what it says in these general conference talks. Okay, so he says, As I stood on the Mount of Olives looking toward Jerusalem, I recalled that on this same mount, the Master instructed Peter, James, John, and Andrew uh, as to the future of the world, even as to his second coming. He told them of wars and rumors of wars, of terrible calamities that would befall nations, kingdoms, and peoples before the Son of Man would come in the clouds of great glory, or sorry, in the clouds of great power and glory. And then he cites uh, Matthew 24, 30, talking about the sign of the Son of Man. Okay. Um, Let's go back a year to 1966, October General Conference, Elder Marion G. Romney of the Council of the Twelve. This is what he says. Informed believers in Jesus Christ, seeing these events, fulfillments of the words, Uh, that he spoke to his disciples as on the last day of his public ministry, he stood before them in the flesh and responded to their questions concerning the signs of his coming in glory in the clouds of heaven. And then he cites Matthew 24, 30 to fulfill the promises he had made concerning the redemption and also the restoration of the scattered of the scattered Israel. Okay. I'm going to skip the next one because we're going to actually read most of that talk. Uh, the next one's going to be Hugh B. Brown, uh, first counselor in the first presidency, April 1966. After referring to the signs that would precede his coming, he said, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, and then there's not really anything else after that. LeGrand Richards, 1958, Elder LeGrand Richards of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. The second great event is when he shall come in power and great glory in the latter days. And then he cites Matthew 24, 30, to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and all the prophets have looked to our day. And I wonder sometimes if we are mindful enough uh, in order to interpret the promises of the prophets. I think of this, the words of the Savior when he said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they that are, and they, okay, and they are they which testify of me. Yes, 
But again, I've read many other scriptures that we should not stick to our own understanding. We need to look to official interpretation from the church. I have a billion scriptures that confirm that. But we do need to also do the legwork and read the scriptures ourselves. But don't start splintering off and coming up with your own theology. Stick to the church and its interpretations. That's why we have prophets and apostles. And then finally, um, this is also 19... 19- 1958, but in April, just as the prophets of old declared the coming of Christ in the meridian of time and gave the signs that would accompany his coming, even to the casting of lots for his raiment when he was crucified, so have the prophets looked forward to the latter days when he would come in the clouds of heaven. And then he cites uh, Matthew 24, 30. Okay, so it's pretty clear that the way that the leadership of the church views the sign of the Son of Man, it's just, it's simply Christ coming with the host of heaven. What I don't know is, is if the reason why it starts out small is because it's like a distance thing, like he's coming through space, through the air, through whatever, I don't know. And so it gets bigger and bigger because he approaches the earth, and so therefore it's closer, or maybe it's some other thing. Um... But whatever it is, the sign of the Son of Man is Jesus Christ coming to the earth uh, in, a, in a public, very visible way. Okay, now let's finish this off by reading this. Christ will come again, Elder L. Ray L. Christensen, assistant to the, to the Council of the Twelve Apostles, April 1966. Okay, I stand before you, my brethren and sisters, in humility and in gratitude for the assurance I have that this is the Church of Jesus Christ, restored in fulfillment of the promises of the Lord, made through his prophets and recorded both in the Old Testament and the New Testament and in other volumes of Scripture, and that his prophet leader in our day is President David O. McKay, who sits with us here today. We are so thankful, President McKay, that you are here. Christ's Earthly Reign The Church of Jesus Christ proclaims without reservation or hesitation the doctrine that Christ will return to the earth to to reign in power and glory. And then he cites the Matthew 24, 30. One of our articles of faith states, we believe that uh, Christ will reign personally upon the earth and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. It will be an actual, literal return of the Lord in person. His coming is assured by Job, who exclaimed, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now, by the way, this is important because it seems that there's many other, or there's at least a number of other churches that don't believe it's literal, um, including some of the LDS like uh, splinter groups like the Community of Christ. I interviewed Linda L. Booth. She uh, was the former president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Community of Christ, based out of Independence, Missouri. I was just there uh, within this last week. And uh, they basically don't believe in anything literal whatsoever. Like the second coming, it's like, no, it, like he, he's come again because now his teachings are with us and his, his spirit is here. I can't remember. I, I think that we had spoken about that specifically. Um, it's been a while since I did that interview, but it was like, I, I'm pretty sure it was like an answer somewhat like that. And uh, of course, there's other churches that have different ideas um, about the second coming and what it means. But in our church, and here you go, it is an actual literal return of the Lord in person. From the writings of Moses, we learn concerning the revelation given to Enoch. And the Lord said unto Enoch, As I live, even so, I, even so will I come in the last days, in the days of wickedness and vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made unto you concerning the children of Noah. During his ministry upon the earth, Jesus gave his disciples assurance of his coming by saying, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then shall, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. To those who are not indifferent and, to, and who do not close their minds to the truth, the words of Jesus revealed only a few decades ago are clear and understandable. To the prophet Joseph Smith came this promise. 
For behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, the, the time is soon, okay, the time is soon at hand that I shall come in a cloud with power and great glory. By the way, this phrase, uh, power and great glory, I did a video about this, and this has been said quite a bit recently. And I take that, that as evidence that we're getting really close to that time where we're going to see the sign of the Son of Man, because in that very scripture, it talks about it being uh, him coming in power and great glory. This has been said quite a bit. In fact, I think I have it here. Um, power. Well, I have this. Power of God in great glory. So let me go like that. Pay attention to this column right, right here. B-U, as in Bravo uniform. And uh, you can see, you know, you go back in the past and it, I don't know, it just it, it comes up sometimes, but then it just really takes off starting in maybe 2016. But it's been mentioned every single year since President Nelson became president of the church. The, the term power of God in great glory. So I think that tells you something because that's a very specific phrase. All right, let's go back to the talk. And it shall be a great day at the time of my coming, for all nations shall tremble. Be prepared for the days to come, in which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God, which is set up on the earth. There's no ambiguity in these words. The Lord will come again, no needs doubt. And when will this stupendous event take place? Ever since his ascension into heaven, the faithful followers of Jesus have looked up looked hopefully for the day when he would return. However, he himself was most explicit in explaining that the precise time of his return would not be known in advance. Of that day and hour, he said, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Watch therefore, for ye know not uh, what hour your Lord doth come. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I need to pause here because um, there are members of the church that believe that uh, the prophet is not going to know when uh, the second coming is going to happen. And to be fair, we don't know how much advanced uh, warning he'll have as far as like the exact day. But, okay, we got to go down to timing of the second coming. Okay, so... <clears throat> The misconception is no man knows the date or the hour of the second coming. This was published in the August 2002 Ensign. Okay? It was published in the Ensign. And this is, this is a quote from Joseph Smith. Did Christ speak this as a general principle throughout all generations? Oh no, he spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living upon the footstool of God knew the day or the hour. But he did not say there was no man throughout all generations that should not know the day or the hour. No, for this would be in flat contradiction with other scripture. For the prophet says that God will do nothing but what he will reveal uh, unto his servants, the prophets. And of course, he's referring to Amos 3, 7, which we just read earlier as we were talking about the sign of the Son of Man. He was saying, no, Mr. Redding didn't see it because I'm the prophet and, the God, and God's not going to do anything until he reveals it to me first. And of course, the sign of the Son of Man is the, the second coming. So at the very least, uh, the prophet will know when the sign of the Son of Man appears, which may not be much time, but we don't, we don't really know. But Joseph Smith said that uh, God will reveal it uh, to at least the prophet. Consequently, it, consequently, if it is not made known to the prophets, it will not come to pass. And then there's some people that say, well, not even Jesus knows when he'll return. And um, that's addressed by Bruce R. McConkie in Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, where he points out a Joseph Smith translation that makes it clear that, yes, of course, Christ is going to know when he comes. Um, anyway, that's all I need to say about that. Let's get back to the talk. Okay. Uh, there is no fixed time for a generation, no year or precise date given by the Lord. 
And uh, before I continue, don't take that to mean that there's not a fixed time. Uh, that's actually been commented on. I, I guess we're coming back here. Okay. This is from... Um, well, let's do Bruce Armour Conkeys because it's shorter. This is from Millennial Messiah. The time for the second coming of Christ is fixed and certain, as was the hour of his birth. It will not vary as much as a single second from the divine decree. He will come at the appointed time. The millennium will not be ushered in prematurely because men turn, turn to righteousness, nor will it be delayed because iniquity abounds. And uh, Joseph Fielding Smith says the same thing. Yeah, he says, I'm going to skip down to halfway through here. This is, this is in Doctrines of, is it in Doctrines of Salvation? Yeah, Doctrine of Salvation. He says, Do not think the Lord delays his coming, for he will not for he will come at the appointed time. Not the time which I have heard some preach when the earth becomes righteous enough to receive him. And of course, that's members of the church that just take the scriptures and then do whatever they want uh, instead of listening to the prophets and the apostles. So anyway, there is an appointed time, but what it's saying here in this uh, talk is that that hasn't been given to us yet. Uh, and, it, and it may only come through the prophet. And may, for all we know, maybe President Nelson knows. And so he's doing what needs to be done for the final you know, parts of preparing for the second coming. Anyway, he will, however, see that, that his word is fulfilled. For he, for he has said, one jot or one tittle uh, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So while the day and the hour are not revealed and will not be made known to man, we can, by learning, the, by learning to understand the signs of the times, by watching the development of the work of God among the nations, and by noting the rapid fulfillment of significant prophecies, uh, perceive the progress, the progressive evidence of the approaching event. Signs of his coming. Indeed, now listen to this. Indeed, most of the significant signs that the scriptures say will precede his coming have already taken place. Again, this talk is from April 1966. And actually, the very next year is when uh, Israel would capture Jerusalem and occupy the city again, even to this day. Okay, so these signs and noteworthy developments include, one, a universal apostasy from the church first established by Christ. Paul taught the Thessalonians, saying, that day will not come except there, there come a falling away first. And he reminded Timothy that the time will come when they will not endure, endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Number two, the gospel in its fullness has been restored as promised, and the Book of Mormon has come forth as prophesied by Ezekiel. Number three, likewise, the priesthood has been restored through the visitation of heavenly beings. Number four, the gospel has for more than 100 years been taught to thousands of people in many nations, and uh, it's, it's gone even further since 1966. By the way, I have, uh, I might, might as well point this out. Let's see, timeline, country visits. No, that's not it. Countries. I need to rename this tab and uh, classify it with my, uh, under the timelines. But it's not a timeline, is it? No, it is a timeline. Okay, so <clears throat> look at this. I've compiled all the countries that have had uh, missions. Okay, we're... we're Missionaries have gone to. Okay. So in, why don't I put the United States first? <laughs> so you have the United States, Canada, UK, Australia, Ireland, and then in 1841, Israel and Palestine. And there have already been missionaries there. Um, in fact, there was the, the, the Turkey mission uh, that included that area, which is modern day Israel. So there has been missionaries already there. And then I have the timeline. It goes, you know, country by country, da, 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 da. Look at all these countries. 
that have been visited. And then I have the ones that do not officially have uh, missions, okay? Afghanistan, Algeria, so on and so forth. However, I've taken note of all the people from these countries between 2011 to 2020 that have immigrated to the United States. So does it have to be that missionaries literally have to be in the streets and go to every single house in all these countries in order for prophecy to be fulfilled? I don't think so. I've done videos about this, and it doesn't seem like church leaders believe that either. And this is just for the United States, these numbers right here. On top of that, some of these some of these countries uh, have temples. So, for example, China has two temples, or it will have two temples, meeting houses, districts, branches. Um, Mali, for example, has a meeting house and a branch. Uh, United Arab Emirates, it's going to have a temple, meeting houses, one meeting house, one stake in two wards. Um, and then um, you have other situations where you have like a country within a country, uh, as is the case with like Bruni, for example. And so it's not hard for them to go to the country that surrounds them or near them. Uh, that has, so like, So if you live in Bruni, then um, it, you potentially have a church building that's within one hour from where you live. Okay, so there's all these different considerations. In Cuba, did you know that Cuba has a meeting, two meeting houses, one district and one branch? It does. I've looked it up. And then on top of that, there's all these people that come to not just the United States, and that's all that I have, but they go to Canada, they go to... Uh, Europe and other places. So that's something to think about. Okay, so number four, the gospel has for more than 100 years been taught to thousands of people in many nations. Number five, as promised by the prophets, both of the Old Testament and of the New Testament, the church has been established in conformity with the original church. Number six, in fulfillment of Malachi's promise, Elijah has restored the keys of the sealing power, which are exercised in the many temples throughout the world today. Other marvelous signs and manifestations will be witnessed both in heaven and in earth prior to his coming. And again, I have to wonder about these asteroids. We must wait for them to develop. How will his coming affect the inhabitants of the earth? The very thought of it thrills the human soul. Um, <clears throat> We are told that his coming will be sublime and glorious, awesome and terrible, terrible to the unrepentant and ungodly, but glorious and delightful to those who are worthy of him and who are ready to meet him. For, he has said, I will reveal myself from heaven with power and great glory. There it is again. With all the hosts thereof and dwell in righteousness with men on earth a thousand years and the wicked shall not stand for they will not repent. The righteous will be caught up. At his coming, Christ will cause the host of righteous ones who have passed from life to come forth from the graves, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up with him to meet him. I've come across like a few different places where it seems like there's some church members that don't think there's going to be a quickening or uh, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter. Um, but like this change that'll come upon our bodies, of course, that, that'll happen to everybody that remains on the earth. But it seems that the righteous saints will not just be quickened like everybody else, but they'll also be caught up, like literally taken somewhere else. Uh, space, I don't know. The sky, I don't know. Somewhere else, I don't know. But in some kind of way, they're going to be caught up uh, to, to actually be with Christ in person. Um, and then not only that, but descend with him to the Jews and then to the world, uh, which we read in Zechariah. It talks about him coming with all the saints. So anyway, in all they who have mourned shall be comforted in all they who have given their lives for my name shall be crowned. Therefore, let your hearts be comforted for all flesh is in mine hands. Be still and know that I am God. Prepare for his coming. Under such conditions, all of us will desire to live with him and with our loved ones upon the earth. And we can do this if 
we, like the five, the five wise among the ten virgins spoken of by the Lord in parable, will not only desire to meet him and be with him, but also make the preparation necessary to do so. You guys, <clears throat> I feel like there's there's still, and this will probably be the case all the way until the end, but there, there's people that are not realizing that there there's a separation. It doesn't matter if you're sealed or not. Um, go go watch the, or go read David A. Bendar's uh, talk about, or his article about wayward children, and there's many others. You, you want to be ready, and we can't force people to be righteous, Okay, we can't force our children, we can't force our parents, our grandparents to be righteous, but we can have an influence on them in hope that they'll follow our example. And uh, but the fact of the matter remains that if you're living a telestial lifestyle, you're not going to be here in the millennium. That's what the wicked is if you're living a telestial lifestyle. So let me read this again. Under such conditions, all of us will desire to live with him and with our loved ones upon the earth. And we can do this if we, like the five wise among the ten virgins spoken of by the Lord in the parable, will not only desire to meet and be with him, but also make the preparation necessary to do so. Again, before this talk, the Overcome the World and Find Rest, in October 2022, Elder Bednar spoke and he talked about being prepared for the wedding feast and what was required and he kept talking about wearing the wedding garment, uh, which I think is a pretty strong allusion to temple, the temple and temple covenants and literally what we're supposed to wear when we go to the temple and when we're outside the temple. Um, through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord made this known to the church saying, and even so I have sent mine everlasting covenant into the world to be a light to the world and to be a standard for my people and for the Gentiles to seek it and to be a messenger before my face to prepare the way before me. At that day, when I shall come in my glory, shall the parable be fulfilled which I spoke concerning the ten virgins. For they that are wise and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide, and remember that President Nelson is really stressing this right now, having the Spirit to be your guide, that you won't be able to survive spiritually in the days ahead unless you have the constant guiding uh, influence of the Holy Ghost and receive personal revelation. For they that are wise and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion uh, singing with songs of everlasting joy. Come, let us anew. The words of a lovely song come to mind. If Christ should come tomorrow, what would he do? What would he say? What would we do? What would we say? Oh, that each in the day of his coming may say, I have fought my way through. I have finished the work thou didst give me to do. Oh, that each each from the Lord may receive his glad word, well and faithfully done, Enter into my joy and sit down on my throne. Enter into my joy and sit down on my throne. Uh, interestingly, that was hymn number 17. I don't know if that's currently in our current hymn book, but at one point it was hymn 17. It is then that we will be that. Okay. It is then that will, it is then that will be seen a fulfillment of the Lord's own prayer, which has been sung so beautifully today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. May it so be, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our master. Amen. So this was a really good talk. Um, yes, we're going to be caught up if you're living righteously and you're worthy of it. You'll be caught up al along with those that are resurrected to meet Christ in the air, whatever that looks like, whatever that means. And uh, most of the things necessary for the second coming, coming, the second coming have already taken place. And uh, we need to keep watching and be aware and not just fall asleep and think that things don't mean anything and that the Lord isn't giving signs to us and trying to wake us up and let us know that he is on the way. So it was a very good talk. I'll put this in the description below in case you want to refer back to this. But um, yeah, 
yeah, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.